Chapter five, dreams as a dialogue with the soul. Discovering value. During my first marriage, I was subjected to many dreams with a similar theme. Either I was running on a treadmill, not getting anywhere, or I was trying to run but can't. My legs are too heavy or I'm enveloped in water. I would think about those dreams, puzzling over them while folding diapers or waiting for the babysitter to come or fixing dinner. But I didn't consciously connect them with what was actually going on in my life. The general tone of my life as a young wife and mother was that of extreme frustration, of having huge energy but not being able to use it, of being afraid to contact it because it would show up as rage toward my husband or, heaven forbid, my children. I didn't consciously think of dreams as important, though these particular ones were, I knew that. I didn't know why. I didn't connect them to my frustration. My conscious concerns were piecemeal, whether these new diapers were helping Colin's diaper rash, what to fix for dinner. I was immersed in life, not evaluating it, until that first peritonitis attack. At 27, during the first year after separating from my husband, my dreams changed completely to invoke new themes. I'm walking alone through huge natural landscapes, mountains, valleys. The feeling was that of trepidation, awe, exploration, feeling dwarfed by the elemental power of my surroundings. By this time I knew my dreams were important and I knew that these dreams symbolized my still tentative investigation into the powerful presence of my own mysterious nature. To go from not paying much attention to dreams to realizing that dreams are of extraordinary value is a big switch, and one does not make this switch without making others too. Transformation is multidimensional. Changes in one area of life bleed into others. For me, one of the first signs of change had to do with books. Like others who describe the process of waking up to a larger reality, at some point during the year preceding my peritonitis attack, I had begun to magnetize certain books. One would be recommended by a friend, another would call to me on the shelf of a bookstore, a third would fall to the floor in front of me at the library. Consciousness was beginning to pierce the fog I'd been in since childhood. Soul was guiding that awareness to select what would influence it choosing from millions of published volumes those particular ones which would help me evolve. One such book was R.D. Lang's The Politics of Experience. When someone loaned this book to me in, the early, in early 1969, I dismissed it as simple-minded. One year later, post-peritonitis, I read it again. This time it was as if I was reading between the lines, or better, as if I was sensing or even inhabiting the space within which the words were written. Now, as far as I was concerned, this book was The Simple Truth. I was fascinated to note the shift in my perception of the meaning of Lang's book. I found this shift in me as fascinating as the book itself. Two science fiction books called to me during that period, Arthur C. Clarke's Childhood's End, which talks about a generation which merges and rises into space, and Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, in which the title says it all. I was feeling strange, and I was feeling lonely, and had it not been for these and other books, I would have, what, gone mad? Been mad? Yet yeah, what is sanity, says Lang, but social agreement as to what is real? If I was the only one in my social reality who was seeing, feeling the world differently, then to discover authors whose books resonated in me, I knew I was not mad. Perhaps the most valuable book for me during that period was C.J. Jung's Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. I treasured this little impressionistic count of his inner life, poring over it to glean the value which had been so missing in my life. Something had happened to me, something profound and life-changing. The entire tone and rhythm of my life had changed, deepened. Pre-peritonitis, a student in one of my undergraduate seminars had asked me if she could write a paper on value. Value? 
I had scoffed. What is value? I have no idea what that word means. My outburst had shocked us all, and it left me vaguely puzzled. Why did her innocent question provoke such an attack? Now, only one year later, I was steeped in value, having discovered its riches in the underground mine of the unconscious and its messages symbolized in dreams. Most autobiographies detail their authors' accounts of and reflections upon worldly events in which they were participants or observers. Jung's autobiography recorded his opening to the larger life within, as presented through the recounting of certain dreams and paranormal experiences. For Jung, dreams seemed to be more important than what happened in his waking life. Never before had I encountered an author so fascinated with exploring the mysterious, unbounded ocean of his own unconscious. I treasured this book like a love letter. During the second year of living on my own, I began to have dreams of a huge warehouse-sized structure being built within huge spaces. In a series of three dreams with this theme over a number of months, the structures became more and more complex and multidimensional. I viewed these structures as symbols for my psyche, which was differentiating through a growing awareness. During this time, I was also dreaming of masks, stages of being embarrassed in public without any clothes. My old persona had been stripped off, and I was trying on new ones, or I was feeling naked, unprotected, vulnerable. It has now been nearly 30 years since I began to reflect on my dreams. During this entire time, whenever I have felt utterly alone and abandoned, I have sooner or later remembered my dreams and my dreaming self. The eye of my waking life is paired with this larger, more mysterious other, which is not confined to the usual laws of time and space. There are times when my dreams have overlapped the dreams of others who are close to me. The poet Yeats, in his autobiography, also speaks of this phenomenon. At other times, my dreams have been prophetic, letting me know what was coming, preparing me, or warning me. No matter what is going on, when I am in serious quandary of any kind, my principal teacher and advisor has been this mysterious other. I ask my unconscious for a dream. I focus my intent on receiving that dream, and it usually comes that very night. I don't always understand these dreams, yet they are always helpful. They throw a new light on my situation, or they place the present conundrum within a larger, more comprehensive framework. I shift my focus and regroup. What bothers me before I go to bed by morning dissolves into a larger space. This may be the original meaning behind the old saying, Sleep on it. Big dreams. In my early 30s, after I was fired from the experimental college and during the recovery period from my third and final peritonitis attack, I was visited by this dream. I am on my horse, Goldie. This is the horse I had as a child. We are going towards the east where the sun is coming up. As a child, I would ride Goldie at dawn. Her full name was Golden Sunlight. Suddenly, Goldie wants to go home again. I turn her around to go back home. We come to a great stone wall. There is a large open gate in the wall, guarded by a wolf sitting on his haunches in front of the gate to the left. The wolf has fierce yellow eyes, and they are staring at me. In order to go through the gate, I must stare the wolf down. This dream was the first of what I call big dreams, these are dreams I remember as well or even better than events in my waking life and from which I date particular eras. The dream itself constitutes or at least signals the beginning of some kind of vast psychic shift. I awakened from this dream feeling like a shockwave had ricocheted through my body. One particular image struck me, the wolf's yellow eyes, the way they stared at me. This part of the dream felt numinous, shining, sacred. 
The intent of the dream was to go home again, but in order to do so, I had to get through the gate, and in order to do that, I had to stare the wolf down. Instinctively, also, I knew that this wolf was called the guardian of the gate, and indeed, looking it up in a symbol dictionary later, I discovered that there is such an archetype, that it takes the form of a wolf, that this guardian of the gate is its name. For many months afterwards, the dream haunted me. I had to go home again, but to what dimension was the dream referring? Six months later, I was visiting my old hometown in Idaho when I met up again with my old high school boyfriend. Dick and I had not seen each other for many years. That night, we discovered that each of us had been dreaming of the other all this time. He became my second husband, I his second wife, our brief marriage, a wonderfully mutual healing experience. I was going back to my hometown to marry my high school boyfriend. I had fulfilled the dream, but part of the dream didn't make sense. What about the wolf, his yellow eyes, staring him down? This aspect of the dream puzzled me, made me uneasy. I married Dick in 1974. By 1976, I was dreaming of snakes. In the first dream, I am turning around to view a bowel movement I have just made in the toilet and seeing it turn into writhing snakes. In the second, I am walking up a grassy hill the grass is lime green, the color of early spring, and individual blades of grass are turning into tiny green snakes. Like a snake, despite our love, I had begun to shed the skin of my second marriage. And though we didn't divorce until 1977, those snake dreams were prophetic. I knew, I knew, not consciously, but in my gut. I didn't like those dreams. I knew they meant change, and I was heartsick to think I would actually have to leave our warm, stable, utterly secure, and loving life. I had gone home again in one sense, but the dream wasn't finished with me. The finale didn't come until three years later, when I married my nemesis, Bill Lohman. One night in September of 1981, I was talking to Phil's teenage niece, who had just arrived for a visit. Phil had gone out, he said, for the evening. I mentioned to her a story Phil had told about his past, and she told me it hadn't happened quite that way. What? I brought up another story. Again, a slight but decided fabrication. The scales began to fall from my eyes. I sat there across the table from Phil's favorite niece, stunned. My eyes opening wider and wider as story after story was discovered to be either embroidered to make Phil into a hero or just plain false. This discovery had an immediate repercussion. It freed me up from 13 months of psychic imprisonment. I could now leave because I finally understood what was going on. No matter how awful life with Phil had been, I was not able to leave him until I had gained some understanding of what was keeping me there. Now I knew Phil was an alcoholic and he was a pathological liar. What others had insisted to me, what I had long suspected but never dared admit or confront, was true. Not only could I not change him, heal him, save him, I had no idea who he was. He had deceived me from the beginning. He had presented the mirror to my face. I had deceived myself from the beginning. Not only was I not a guru, I was a stupid fool. By the time she and I were through talking, it was midnight. The job was done. In the morning, I would pack up and leave, taking her with me. At 1 a.m., I was startled awake by noise outside, the sound of the door of his big old Chevy truck slamming. A voice inside me commanded, Center yourself. You have one minute. The truck door slammed. The outside door creaked open, slammed shut. Then the inside door opened, slammed shut. A light flicked on, footfalls, somewhat unsteady but loud, heavy, coming closer. The bedroom door opened to reveal his dark form illumined from behind. Phil was drunk. In our long and difficult journey, I had never seen him drunk. Now, after 13 terrible months, he was finally showing me who he was, his soul so long burdened by his wounded personality 
He said he had been a black beret in Vietnam and elsewhere, an assassin. True? Who knows? And he was now displaying for me the full extent of the damage. Phil was not a slap-happy drunk, nor a dull drunk. He was a mean drunk, intimidating and violent. He sat down on the bed where I was now sitting up, centered. I looked into his glittering eyes. Shock. Phil's eyes were yellow, not the whites of his eyes, but the iris. His eyes were normally greenish. The shock of that sudden soul contact began a four-hour ordeal. In order to get out of there, I had to take power over him. In order to do that, I had to continuously stare him down, lock in eye contact. Meanwhile, he was getting out his guns, caressing them, threatening me with them. Meanwhile, I was telling him as quietly and calmly as possible that I was going to call the police. He kept grabbing the phone out of my hands, Finally, he grabbed the phone a final time and called up the owner of the bar where he had been drinking. That man, bless him, a stranger, came over at 4 a.m. I asked him to please keep Phil there so that his niece and I could leave the house, which we did, stopping at a phone booth to call a woman I had just met to beg her to let us hide in her house until I could decide what to do next. That night climaxed. The progressed sun opposite natal Pluto plus the transit Pluto square natal Pluto set of aspects I had been eagerly awaiting in my astrological chart. I thought power would just come to me as my due during this once-in-a-lifetime Plutonian, doubly Plutonian uh, event. Though I had spotted theories about Pluto and its effects to my astrological clients, I had had no idea what death and resurrection actually meant to the psyche until that fateful night. The woman who left the house in the early dawn with Phil's niece in her protection was not the woman who had welcomed that niece the night before. And that was the night I finally fulfilled the promise of the dream, staring down the wolf with yellow eyes, the guardian of the gate, Phil Lohman. Seven years after the dream, I had finally come home, not to Dick, not to my hometown, but to myself. I was almost 40 years old. Dreams in my 40s. I remember somewhere Jung said that in the first half of our life, we are busy with the outside world, that once we hit midlife, we turn inward. He called the resulting process of integrating the heretofore undiscovered layers of our self individuation. Meeting, living with, and escaping from Phil Lohman had unnerved me. I realized I didn't know myself very well, didn't understand the part of me that could throw me into hell and keep me there for so long. I was beginning to understand that every light throws a shadow, that as the macrobiotic philosophy puts it, Every front has a back. My shadow was self-destructive. I wanted to know why. Then I discovered Orphan Annie, see chapter 4. During the time I was consciously working with her, I was dreaming of babies, small children. Usually I was the mother or the caretaker. I had left the baby in the bathwater, untended, or I was trying to revive the baby, or the parents came to take the baby from me, not appreciating that I had been tending it. A dream theme which occurred with variations throughout my entire 40s was that of being chased by a scuzzy white male. Knowing this had to do with the integration of my animus, my own inner male energy, I was grateful to finally dream that I had turned to face the one who was stalking me. Soon after this series ended, I met my husband, Jeffrey Joel, a man with a powerful, protective, gentle energy. Earlier, towards the end of the period during which I was seeing the man who was abandoning me every three weeks on schedule, see the chapter on walking, I had another big dream. This dream gave me the final insight needed to break the spell of my original childhood drama. I am walking with a long stick to see some dead snakes. They are on the rooftop of an old building. But first I see a huge old tree under which is a blanket spread out. I know that under that blanket is a porcupine with a snake wrapped around it. 
I use my stick to flip the blanket off and am surprised to see not just one snake, but two snakes wrapped around the porcupine. All three of them are dead. The porcupine's quills have so decayed they've turned to mush and are no longer protective. The two snakes, though dead, look alive and they are wound around the porcupine in perfect alignment, their heads in the same direction. I go to the building and start flipping the dead snakes off the roof with my stick. One of them almost lands on me. I'm so revulsed I walk away from the entire situation. The difference between this dream with snakes and the snake dreams during the end of my time with Dick was immediately apparent. If snakes are the energy of renewal, aliveness, then these snakes only seemed alive. They represented dead energy, something which I no longer needed. The next day, I went walking with my friend Clarissa, wanting to process this dream. The dream, I told her, is about my lover, his wife and me, his ex-wife and me. I am the porcupine. They are perfectly aligned with one another, and both are squeezing me. I cannot simply blame her, but must look to them equally for what they've done to me. Immediately, Clarissa responded, I think you have to look deeper, Anne. The snakes are your parents. The finality in her tone created a shock wave through my body. She was correct. The triangle I had created with this man and his ex-wife mirrored the dynamic among my mother and father and me as a small child. The sense of abandonment began when he went off in World War II and she was left weeping, despondent, unable to mother me. Yet she was all I had. Then when he returned from the war, my sense of abandonment deepened when she sided with him over me. This man had always reminded me of my mother rather than my father. In being with him, I was proud to think I was breaking the pattern of connecting and then fighting with men who reminded me of my father. What this dream told me, though it would take another year before I was able to fully feel the early childhood ramifications, was that my parents were aligned, that it was the dynamic between them which had suffocated me, not just one parent or the other. In order to integrate the male and female within myself, I would first have to dismantle the dynamics of that original triangle. A few years later, I made another discovery about that dream and laughed at the obvious symbolism. The snakes were wrapped around the porcupine like a caduceus, symbol of the medical profession. My father is a medical doctor and my mother a nurse. Then in 1988, when I was 45 years old, another big dream. I am standing on a huge ice field. I am part of a team of researchers excavating. We have dug down to a huge head of a bull, its horns like crescent moons. The bull's head is the size of a many-storied building. Frozen in ancient times, it is now thawing, coming to life. At the time of the dream, I instantly interpreted it as the reawakening of sex force within myself. The next day, I drove over to the house of the man I had broken up with several months earlier and brazenly forced myself on him sexually. He was shocked and delighted. Fifteen months later, I was in Crete with Clarissa at Nosos, a famous ruins of the ancient Minoan civilization, the last outpost of the goddess. We saw the huge horns of a bull, like crescent moons carved out of stone. Later, at a museum, we picked up a postcard showing a bull's head with crescent horns. The entire head looked exactly like the image in my dream. The dream had been prophetic, first of our trip to Greece 18 months later, and perhaps that dream unconsciously set that trip in motion. Secondly, though I didn't realize it at the time, the sex force which surged through me in the aftermath of the dream is, I would say now, synonymous with sacred goddess energy, what we must reintegrate in order to heal our civilization. After Crete, Clarissa and I traveled to the Peloponnesus to the ruins of the sanctuary of Asclepios, the Greek god of healing. It was a brilliant late autumn afternoon. As soon as we got off the bus there, the surrounding hills and proximity to the sea felt so familiar. I felt like I was drugged in trance. 
Within minutes of beginning to wander through the ruins, I lay down next to a crumbling wall and fell asleep. Later in the museum, I was astonished to discover that this sanctuary of Asclepios was a temple of dreams, that when one who needed to be healed arrived there, he or she would sleep in a great oblong hall with others. In the morning, his or her dream of that night would be told to the healers who would see in it instructions for regaining health. Shortly before our trip to Greece, I had started the magazine Crone Chronicles, of which the founding purpose was and is to activate the archetype of the crone within contemporary Western culture. The symbol of this publication is the raven, which came to me in a dream a few weeks prior to the sudden decision to start the magazine. I don't remember the dream itself, but it did wake me up, or rather a huge black bird woke me up, clutching on my shoulders with its talons from behind. It cawed or crowed at me. Wake up! Wake up! It's time! It's time! Goddess Dreams, 1996. As I allow my dreams to permeate my waking life, paying attention to their sometimes prophetic nature, to how individual and collective orders interpenetrate, I move further and further out of the mainstream and into magic. Perhaps this is why so few people dare to take their dreams seriously. To do so is to profoundly disturb our socially constructed logical linear facade. In 1996, I had three big dreams, one right after the other, which I will be contemplating and fulfilling for years. All three of these dreams have, I feel, both individual and collective significance. I will conclude this chapter by presenting them with commentary from my journal. Dream, February 24th, 1996. I woke up in the early a.m. feeling as if I had been on a long journey of which only two images remained, and they were vague and fuzzy. Then I dove down again into sleep, and it felt as if I had reviewed the entire journey, again leaving me with the same two images. First image. I am before a tribunal, which is sitting in judgment on me. Sitting in a chair, I face four people who are sitting in a line at the table. They are all professors of philosophy at Boston University. The one on the left speaks first. He is a hooded figure, dressed in a long robe with its hood shading his face so I cannot even see the eyes. The figure feels more archetypal than personal, although he says his name is Husserl. He demands an accounting of me. Who am I? What have I done with my life? All the time I am aware that Agassi, my mentor in graduate school, sits next to him. I am thankful for his presence and feel a heart connection between us. The other two figures are in the background. I tell Husserl my name and say that though I didn't have him for a teacher at BU, I was there between 1966 and 72. The scene now shifts to that Agassi is sitting where Husserl was, and I am sitting near him at the end of the table. Nancy Frieden, a friend from my 20s, is there, witnessing my conversation with him. The feeling is warm, familiar, intimate. I tell him how much I appreciate him and am grateful to him that he has remained with me all these years, that I often think about trying to connect with him again. He replies quietly in a sort of awestruck tone. After the explosion in Washington, I saw the face of God. The feeling is that he's telling me that he now understands where I was coming from back then, and he shares the same reality. The second scene, a white wall, in the center of which is a white door which is closed. I am standing directly in front of the door. The feeling is I must go through it. At first, when I woke up from this dream, the two images of the grim reaper and the white door made me think of death. I spent a few days mulling it over, feeling that I needed to prepare for death, if necessary. Going through initial panic, then just getting into the feeling of, wow, am I being asked to move into a different reality now? Am I needed elsewhere? When I told the dream to Jeff, he agreed it represented a death of some kind and gave the name Husserl a dimension by saying he, a German philosopher, talked about the thing in itself in phenomenology 
as if it was unknowable, i.e., he was anti-mystic. He also mentioned Husserl's association with Heidegger, who has been linked to Hitler. My heritage is German, and as a child, I had experienced my father as a dictator. From my journal, I wasn't able to speak to Claudia about the dream until last night, Monday, February 26. She brought out the implied polarity between the Grim Reaper figure and Agassi. The Grim Reaper is my father, and he does not know me or feel me, and so I have to give him an accounting of my life to explain and defend myself. Agassi was the good father, in a sense, as he helped me overcome my own father, and it turns out he understood the religious nature of my quest. The paradox is here, mystic, Agassi me, versus the materialist, Husserl, my father. The mystic materialist polarity, working with that all my life, how to embrace them, integrate them. Also, at first, I saw the wall as having a colonial feeling and connected that to Washington, which meant Washington, D.C., then one night later, I realized Washington could or could also mean Seattle, where I am going in 10 days, again to be judged by my father. The explosion then could be something psychic and or this could be a prophetic dream about this country, its politics, blowing up the White House. Claudia mentioned this and I had also thought of it and there's now a current movie preview which shows this happening. Having talked to her, now feeling much more profoundly the Gemini twin polarity between the Grim Reaper and Agassi figures, how I am symbiotic with both and they symbiotic with each other, I sense that the door represents the future. The door and wall felt peaceful, as if this is what lies beyond this deep-seated polarity within me. Astrologers, in my natal chart, I have Saturn and Uranus in early Gemini conjunct. Gemini symbolizes the conscious mind. Saturn in Gemini refers to a mind which is strong, rational, logical, traditional. Uranus in Gemini refers to its opposite, a mind which is intuitive, unpredictable, unusual, open to the unknown. This conjunction is opposed to Mars and early Sagittarius. Sagittarius being opposite Gemini is the sign of the search for universal understanding. Mars is focused energy or drive in Sagittarius means that I'm driven to search for universal understanding. The entire configuration of Saturn Uranus opposite Mars is now 1996, beginning to be conjuncted by transit Pluto in early Sagittarius. Thus, this dream was symbolizing the Pluto transit of this significant aspect of my chart. On Sunday, the very day Pluto turned to, this is again from the journal, on Sunday, the very day Pluto turned to go retrograde, more insights into this dream with Agassi and the Grim Reaper. When a planet turns to go either retrograde or direct is when that planet's energy is felt most intensely. Sitting in a restaurant with three women I do not know well, I tell them the dream. One of them says, in reference to Agassi's remark, when the explosion happened in Washington, I saw the face of God. The explosion has already happened. All of a sudden, I focused on the time I lived in Washington, D.C. as an undergraduate, and then I felt my mind like a laser beam go rooting for what that explosion was, like a sort of rat-tat-tat, bingo! There it was, the image of my first son, Sean, being born. The entrance into the mysteries, there on that awful sterile table in the middle of the hospital with the macho doctor and all the artificial lights and the gleaming steel, the miracle of creation that this fully formed human being should emerge from between my legs, that I was the vessel for creation. Yes, when that explosion happened in Washington, I saw the face of the goddess and that was the other world which I entered and soon tucked away and which was the grounding for everything that happened next. By the time I met Agassi, who for me represents Uranus and Gemini, I was ready for him. He taught me that truth cannot be accessed through the left brain, and yet he was caught up in the left brain and knew it was a dead end. He somehow was also in touch with the mysteries, with mysticism, though he couldn't afford to feel. Seeing Dad as Saturn and Gemini, and those two, Dad and Agassi, Saturn and Uranus and Gemini, as twins, with me opposing them as Mars and Sagittarius, the seeker going after the truth. 
Now, with Pluto right on top as if it, as it was turning, I remembered this extraordinary time when Sean was born and how it had been the foundation for all my seeking since. A few months later, a second big dream moved me deeper into goddess reality. I see a small motorboat leaving the dock to go out in the open water. In it, I see, standing in the corner of the boat with her back to me, a tall, broad-shouldered, narrow-waisted, well-muscled woman in full wedding dress. I realize then that this event is a wedding of some kind. I talk to Claudia about these dreams, and she tells me the woman in the boat feels like an Amazon. Lori comments, Aha! Bride of Neptune! Despite the deeply feminine and sacred feeling in the second big dream, a few months later I was reliving once again the feeling of worthlessness which had accompanied me as a child. The sense of depression and futility was so strong that I stayed home from work for a day. That night I received the third big dream of this year. Again, the theme is that of a wedding, an integration, a celebration of feminine energy. Here's the dream. Judy Tepley is to receive some kind of huge recognition or award after a lifetime of expressing her extraordinary talent without any kind of recognition or recompense. In order to receive her award properly, she is going to get out a dress of hers which comes from her mother's line, was her grandmother's or her great-grandmother's. The dress is pure white, made out of a heavy, rich material, and is in perfect condition, as if it has never been worn. I see a small section of it, how the seams are beautifully and intricately done, etc. She is going to have an artist sew on huge jewels in some kind of pattern on the chest of the dress to make it fit for her presentation at the award-giving ceremony. She is going to hire Lori Lacey. No, she's going to hire Renee Shields to sew on the jewels in a pattern of Judy's design. She will ask $2,000 for this task of designing pattern and sewing on the jewels to be received from the same people who are now building a, her a house. Judy is the perfect symbol for that rich, artistic, feminine part of me that has not yet been recognized. And in waking life, Judy really is having a house built for her. Judy's physical build reminds me of Amazon energy, as does this dream resonate with the other dream of the Amazon goddess woman dressed in a white backless wedding gown, standing in a small boat with her back to me, being motored out to sea. Again, feels like a bride, like some kind of integration is taking place. But this time, the emphasis seems to be on receiving reward for work well done. Renee, my mother's name is Renee. My friend Claudia says, you say, as if it has never been worn, but of course it has been worn. What was real long ago is returning. The word René comes from the French, meaning René, reborn. I wait the fulfillment of these three dreams.